Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. Hello, Warbirders. Okay, so this is a part three. So if you haven't heard Mosquito part one and two, go over and get caught up, and we'll be waiting for you right here, all right? Okay, so although less famous as Operation Oyster from 1942 to summer 1943, Mosquito bombers flew many other high-speed, medium, and low-altitude daylight missions all over Germany and German-occupied Europe. Meanwhile, as more and more completed Mossies left the factories, they were formed into more and more squadrons. And in June 1943, these were formed into the Light Night Striking Force. These pathfinding Mosquitoes would do a variety of missions, finding targets using radio navigation aids and radar and marking them with flares, performing nuisance raids to throw off the night fighters by marking and then dropping a few 4,000-pound cookies on other cities, and being the plane that carried the master bomber, the one who would orchestrate the main raid. The mosquito's speed made them very difficult to intercept. As time went on, the diversions actually became raids in their own right, 100 or more Mossies dropping 4,000-pound cookies each on a city can't really be seen as a diversion anymore. Meanwhile, the night-fighting Mossies were on the defensive line back over England. They were also called up for offensive duties going after their own nocturnal counterparts in the Luftwaffe during RAF night raids, either hunting down the Luftwaffe fighters in the bomber stream using radio countermeasures to disrupt their hunting, or hitting the Luftwaffe night fighter bases just as the exhausted fighters were landing. Not to feel left out, the Mosquito fighter bomber was added to the second tactical air force from its inception in June 1943. This had a year-long mission to prepare for Overlord. Following D-Day, three wings of fighter-bomber Mossies performed close support work for the Allied armies moving across Europe and also went hunting for V-1 bases. The 30th of January 1943 was the 10th anniversary of the Nazis' rise to power, and the expectation was that there was going to be plenty of Nazi head honcho speechifying on that day. The RAF Mossies were cheeky enough to hit the Berlin Broadcasting Station in the middle of Luftwaffe Chief Reich Marshal Hermann Göring's talk, knocking him off the air. It was one thing to do this once, but they did it again in the afternoon, tripping up Propaganda Minister Joseph Goebbels' speech. This and other actions really turned Göring against the wooden wonder. Although in his rant that I'm about to read for you, he sounds more jealous than angry. Open quotes. In 1940, I could fly as far as Glasgow in most of my aircraft, but not now. It makes me furious when I see the mosquito. I turn green and yellow with envy. The British, who can afford aluminum better than we can, Knock together a beautiful wooden aircraft that every piano factory over there is building. And they give it a speed which they have now increased yet again. What do you make of that? There is nothing the British do not have. They have the geniuses and we have the nincompoops. After the war is over, I'm going to buy a British radio set. Then at least I'll own something that has always worked. Close quotes. Oh, and don't forget the Coastal Command Mosquitoes. From 1943 on, they were out there, looking to sting U-boats. Their usual technique was to hit the boats just as they were arriving back to port, the times gleaned by codebreakers. Just as the U-boats surfaced, the Mossies would arrive on the scene to ruin their day, with rockets or the 57mm shells of the Tzitzi. At least eight U-boats were sunk, by or with help from mosquitoes. The last mosquito war missions involved mosquitoes of 143 Squadron and 248 Squadron RAF, who, in mid-May, were looking for U-boats who maybe still wanted to fight, even though the war was over. They didn't find any. 
Often in this podcast, I'll say that a new use was found for the aircraft. But it is rare to say that this was the only aircraft that was called on to do this new job, repeatedly. In the case of Mossy, I guess we could call this job jailbreaking. The first operation of this type we are going to look at is Operation Jericho. Now this story could merit a whole episode to itself, but as we're mainly interested in the mosquito part of it, I'm going to try to keep the rest of it brief. In the lead up to D-Day and Operation Overlord, there was intense intelligence and resistance activity going on in France. The Allies and Resistance were gathering information and making plans to aid in the operation, while the Gestapo was trying to discover said plans and break up the intelligence and resistance networks working on them. When the Gestapo captured someone, they ended up in Amiens prison to be worked over, which would often yield more names and more prisoners to be questioned. In February 1944, it seemed that a critical mass of prisoners had been taken that would soon cause the complete collapse of the resistance movement in France just as it was to be really needed for Overlord. There were also reports that two American spies and a British agent had just recently arrived in the prison. Something had to be done, and so planning for a jailbreak began. Planning was complicated by the fact that there had recently been a resistance raid on another French prison, Saint-Quentin, the raid had failed, with many resistance casualties, and security had subsequently been beefed up at other Gestapo prisons, including Amiens, which now had 80 troops and a machine gun nest covering the approach. A ground attack just wouldn't be enough. They would need help from above. Resistance members gathered as much information on the prison as they could, including one of them who inspected the walls while passionately making out with his girlfriend against said wall. The mission was given to 140 Wing RAF, 2nd Tactical Air Force, and would include 18 Mossies, 6 from No. 487 Squadron, Royal New Zealand Air Force, 6 from No. 464 Squadron, RAAF, and 6 from Mosquitoes of 21 Squadron. A photographic reconnaissance, PR, Mosquito, was also added to the mix, as were units of Hawker Typhoon escorts. Group Captain Percy Pickard was put in charge. With information from France, a plaster model of the prison was built and plans were finalized. On the 17th of February, the Mosquitoes were to hit the prison at high noon. Timing was important, as many of the guards would be distracted on their lunch break and the prisoners would be all in the central hall for their meal. The weapons to be carried were two 500-pound semi-armor-piercing bombs for the outer walls, and two 500-pound medium-capacity bombs for the inner walls with 11-second delays on the fuses. The Mossies of 21 Squadron had a grim mission. If the wall breaching failed and the jailbreak subsequently didn't work, they were to hit the prison buildings themselves with the goal of killing all the prisoners. Dead prisoners can't give up sensitive information or reveal any other uncaptured resistance members. If this extermination attack wasn't needed, Pickard was to transmit Red Daddy Red on the radio. If he was unable to do so, the pilot of the photographic reconnaissance mosquito would make that call. You'd want to make sure that that call got through, or 21 Squadron would kill everybody for nothing. With the air plan formed, it was divulged to the resistance for them to put the ground plan into operation. They would be placing about 100 members around the prison, ready to help break in and also to deal with the escaping prisoners. They had supplies of civilian clothing and travel documents and vehicles ready to spirit the escapees away to safe houses. Some were even dressed in SS uniforms, with special markings to distinguish themselves from the real SS. The resistance had a member of their own get arrested to pass on the information inside. Everyone was told that, you know, if you hear airplanes outside, you should hit the deck. A corps of 16 prisoners were told the plans to help from inside. 
On the planned day of the mission, February 17th, the weather was truly horrendous with low clouds and snow blizzards. However, there was hope for clearing the next day. On the 18th, the weather still sucked, but it was expected to improve. So the crews were awoken and brought to study models of the prison. At 11 o'clock, it was time to go, and the Mossies fired up their engines and headed down the runways. After liftoff, at about 100 feet off the deck, they were on their instruments in thick mist and snow. Forming up was impossible in the mess, so they headed for the coast, and out over the channel, the weather did clear up. Some of the escorting typhoons found their charges, and some did not. Some typhoons and mossies were forced to turn back due to the bad weather. But either way, within minutes, whoever was able to continue were all over France and headed for the jail. The typhoons that made it formed up into a defensive circle at about 1,000 above ground, tangling with some FW-190s that had arrived on the scene. Now I know that Luke Skywalker's X-Wing attack on the Death Star had been based on the Dam Buster raid. George Lucas even used scenes from the Dam Busters movie as inspiration. However, the Mosquito attack on Amiens Prison had a very similar feel to the Death Star attack. Rather than a space station trench, it was a long, snow-covered road with trees on either side. Rather than a horribly critical exhaust port that the Empire had stupidly forgot to cover with a grate or something, it was the exposed wall of the prison. Rather than proton torpedoes, it was 500-pound semi-armor-piercing bombs. One of the Mossy pilots later wrote, open quotes, I shall never forget that road, long and straight and covered with snow. It was lined with tall poplars, and we were flying so low that I had to keep my aircraft tilted at an angle to avoid hitting the tops of the trees with my wing. The poplar suddenly petered out, and there, a mile ahead, was the jail. It looked just like the model, and within a few seconds, we were almost on top of it. Close quotes. You can almost hear Obi-Wan Kenobi whispering to him, Use the force, Tommy. At 12.01, the first bomb started hitting the walls, and initially, the walls held. Five minutes later, more Mossies flung their bombs at the wall, and as Elvis would later sing, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, and the walls came a-tumbling down. The guardhouse was hit too. Prisoners were seen running out. Pickard transmitted the Red Daddy Red call on the radio to prevent the Terminators from doing their extermination job. The Mossies ran from home, with the 190s pouncing on them and typhoons pouncing on them. Two mosquitoes and one typhoon were shot down, with Pickard's plane being one of the casualties. He and his navigator were killed. Although the raid was a success, it was not a complete success. 255 of 832 prisoners escaped. Some of these had been scheduled for execution. Many prisoners were shot by guards during the escape, but then again, about 50 guards were killed too. Although many of the prisoners were recaptured afterwards, many of them had been able to pass on names of Gestapo agents and informers, which hampered their operations. War is a dirty business, and this kind of war is extra dirty, and I guess to expect more from this type of raid would be magical thinking. Later in 1944, Mossies would be called on again for a similar mission. This was a raid on the Gestapo headquarters in Aarhus, Denmark. Now, Aarhus is spelled more like Aarhus, but I'm relying on a Google pronunciation guide. So if I'm wrong, blame Google. The Gestapo there was actually having wonderful success as key members of the Danish resistance were being arrested and during interrogation were giving up other members. In early October, Ruth Philipson, who was the main messenger for the leadership of the resistance, was arrested. Things were getting critical. The entire resistance could be exposed and dismantled. Something had to be done. A ground attack was pondered, but ruled out. So who are you going to call? Mosquitoes. 
Reconnaissance was done, and this time a full-scale plan was drawn on the ground in a training area with chalk in order to allow the Mossy pilots to practice it. In Aarhus, the Gestapo headquarters had civilian hospitals on both sides of the building, so the bombing had to be extra precise. The attack was planned to occur on a weekday between 11.30 and 12 when Danish prisoners would not be in the offices at that time. They would be back in their prison cells in another building eating lunch. On the other hand, the Gestapo would be present as they ate their lunch in the headquarters building. On the morning of October 31st, 24 mosquitoes were bombed up, again with weapons that had 11 second fuses. Extra fuel tanks were needed for the long flight across the North Sea. At 8 a.m., the crews were briefed on the target, and by 9.20, everyone was airborne, including eight P-51 Mustang escorts. At 11.38, they arrived at the rendezvous at Skandenborg Lake and started circling for their turns to attack. The first wave headed in, and at 11.41, the first high-explosive bombs were going through the doors of the headquarters. The second, third, and fourth waves followed, the later waves dropping incendiaries on the now busted open offices. By 12.30, everyone was out of Danish airspace. Only one Mossy didn't make it back. It had been hit by flak, but it did manage to limp to neutral Sweden, where it crash-landed and its crew was interned. Somewhere between 150 and 200 Gestapo members were killed, and much of their archives and their files on the resistance were blown up and burnt. There was collateral damage, though, and at least 30 Danes were killed. Ruth Philipson, the capture of whom had triggered the whole thing, was actually in the headquarters for interrogation during the raid, and in the chaos, she managed to escape, and she later made it to Sweden also. This was considered the most successful RAF raid of its kind during the war. The same could not be said about the last raid that we are going to look at. This one was directed against the Gestapo headquarters in Copenhagen. The Dutch resistance, perhaps because of the great success of the Aarhus raid, had been asking for a similar job in Copenhagen. The RAF had been wary of doing it, as again... The target was in the middle of the city. But in March 1945, they finally agreed to the raid, which was named Operation Carthage. Twenty Mossies were tasked with the bombing, and 30 P-51 fighters would provide cover. On the 21st of March 1945, the attacking force reached Copenhagen at about 11 a.m. and began their runs on the target just above the rooftops. They were so low that one mosquito hit a lamp post and was destroyed. Results of the raid were, well, mixed. The Gestapo headquarters had been hit, and again, their records were burnt up. Eighteen prisoners escaped, while eight were killed. Fifty-five German soldiers, forty-seven Dutch Gestapo employees also died in the headquarters building. Unlike Aarhus... Four Mosquitoes and two Mustang fighters went down and nine Allied airmen were killed. The one thing that made the raid less successful was a major oops in target recognition. There was another building in the area that looked similar to the headquarters and unfortunately that was the Jean d'Arc school. The Mosquito that I mentioned earlier that hit the lamppost crashed and burned nearby which drew some pilots' eyes to the school building, which they mistook as the target being hit by earlier bombers. Two more Mossies lined up on the school and let loose. Their bombs killed 86 children and 18 adults, including nuns, firemen, teachers, and two fathers that tried to save their children. A further 67 children and 35 adults were also injured. The pilots involved were not told of the mistake until after VE Day. I bet they wished they'd never been told at all. Continuing with the theme of special missions, 
Earlier I mentioned that in a pinch, mosquitoes could carry one or two passengers in speedy but very minimal comfort in the bomb bay. To protect against the cold at altitude, the passenger would be heavily dressed and lie on a felt mattress on the closed Bombay doors. Comforts were scant, but there was an oxygen supply, a thermos of coffee, a reading lamp, and a piece of string that was tied to the pilot's leg that could be pulled to get his attention. The main area where these flights occurred was to and from neutral Sweden. A civilianized mosquito was used to transport such high-value items as diplomatic bags, POW mail, and propaganda, such as magazines, newspapers, etc., into Sweden, and precision ball bearings and machine tool steel from Sweden. As Sweden was neutral, these mossies were registered with civilian markings and were operated by crews who were, in quotes, civilian employees of the British Overseas Airway Corporation, BOAC. One famous passenger to take the flight was the physicist Niels Bohr, who left Stockholm in 1943. It was almost his last flight, too, as Bohr wasn't wearing his oxygen equipment properly, became hypoxic, passed out, and stopped answering the crew's queries over the intercom. The pilot, guessing the problem, descended to a lower altitude where the air was thicker in order to keep Bohr alive. Bohr had no complaints, though. He said that during the flight he had slept like a baby. Escaped POWs who made it to Sweden were also flown out via this method, including those from the Wooden Horse and the Great Escape Methods. In 1954, Spartan Air Services of Ottawa, Ontario, Canada purchased 10 mosquitoes for aerial survey work. These were fitted with an extra fuel tank, a clear transparent nose, and three camera windows in the fuselage. These aircraft worked at performing photo surveys over Canada, Central and South America, and Africa, contributing greatly to the mapping of these largely uncharted areas. They continued doing this work until the early 1960s. Survivors Of the over 7,000 Mossies built, there are a good number, about 30, of survivors on display, taxiable, and even four in airworthy status. It's also heartening to know that many restoration projects are underway and should make sure that this beautiful aircraft is never forgotten and can be seen by many. The Mossy is probably the warbird that I have been physically closest to, having been allowed to stick my head inside Kilo Bravo 336, the Mossy on display at the Canada Aviation and Space Museum in Ottawa. Thanks again to all who support the podcast via PayPal at WOWB17, and if you haven't, please consider. I support the podcasts that I listen to. If you like to watch as well as listen, check out the YouTube channel, and you can purchase Warbird merch at the kit shop. You can also check out some photos of what we have been talking about on the Facebook page. Until next time.